So, David, here we are. You're back with Brian Eno again. How did you two get together after the long break? Shotgun wedding. Ninety-two. <laughs> uh, Brian and Anthea came to uh, see my wife and I get married. Uh, and I'd written music for the church and for the party afterwards. Um, and at the time, it was just instrumental. And Brian liked some of the things that I'd been doing in the music. I was sort of taking the saxophone and distressing it and sort of using electronic things on it to sort of either enhance it or break it down as a sound. Um, and the format was vaguely dub. Uh, and I think Brian sort of liked the juxtaposition of things that I was doing. And, and, it, and it got us talking about state of music and all that and possibly where it could go and other interesting avenues that could be taken. Had you actually had much contact with him in the intervening, what would have been, what, 13 years, 12, 13 no, years? No, virtually nothing. And the strange thing about Brian and my relationship is that when we do sort of meet again, we, do, we pick up virtually as though that no time has passed at all. I mean, chatted a little bit about what we'd done in the last <laughs> in the intervening 10 years. Yeah. Um, but it was sort of back to, back to business, you know, immediately. There's How do you two actually work together? I mean, when you came to make this album, who does what? One thing that's always um, fascinated me talking to artists that Brian works with is, what is it that Brian does? Well, I don't quite know, but it, it really works well. So I try to identify it, and I think it has more to do with the fact that he br brings his innate sense of context into a studio. Um, and he can contextualise something in, in such a different way from anybody else that I've so ever what, worked What do you with. mean by contextualise? Well, okay, he can look at a whole mass of work that to the artist and, and cohorts is very confused and doesn't seem to have a central voice of any kind. And he will use his philosophical framing device and say, that bit there is really good. Get rid of all the rest. And he will refine and hone things down and, and home in on something that's truly important about the work that one's doing. Um, and then he's very also very good at what ifing, and he'll set up, what if the guitar player got on the drums for this track? What if we didn't have any bass on this track whatsoever? What would happen, I wonder? Those sorts of situations. But he's continually full of them. He never dries. Hi. So you write the songs and you bring them in? Well, I'm not sure if I write the songs <laughs> anymore. Its uh, authorship is in question. <laughs> it really is the 90s. Uh, a, a, a lot of what we've put out on uh, the Outside album, in fact, were improvisations that, that were put together by all of us. And indeed, I've credited even down to the drummer uh, by virtue of the fact that he was in the room when we actually wrote these things, it seemed rather unfair to exclude him from writing credit, and indeed his royalty. Um, so I, I sort of just saw it more as a workshop situation in those particular cases, that everybody contributed to it. Um, I guess lyri uh, lyrically, I, I still sort of, yes, they're mine. Well, they're mine and Macintoshes. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> there there, there could be a Apple. dispute raised. That, yes, yeah. Apple might make claims on royalties. Um, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, so how different then was it making this album from the three albums that you made with, with Brian before? I mean, this, this new album has been described as a and one of the releases as a return to the, the scenes of your greatest artistic triumph. Yeah, back there. I think probably the great difference is that uh, at that particular period, uh, we alternated performance. Brian would go and work for a couple of hours. Brian is quite... He takes quite a long time when he works, say, with the synthesizer or whatever, and he would take long stretches in the studio, three or four hours at a time, and then he would go and get some rest, and I would go in and screw up everything he'd done and put my own spin on what he was doing. Then I'd leave and he'd come back and correct everything. And it sort of worked in that kind of... Uh, like by negotiation. Yes, it was by negotiation. By negotiation. <laughs> 
Uh, and we, then we, we arrived at, at, a, a, at a final piece of work by tacit agreement that we'd sort of gone far enough. Trying to recapture some of the spirit and some of the sound of, say, the Low album or the Heroes album. I think we, we, uh, there were definite aspects of what we did back then that I think unconsciously we gravitated back toward, like the drum sound. But I think, other than that, no, I think it was working pretty much on a blank canvas. Um, and it was uh, about n not going in with uh, uh, pre-created songs, no songs. Um, a collection of uh, ideas in terms of lyrics or subject matter, um, as ephemeral and as diverse as possible. And taking in musicians who would be quite willing to um, break down their own inhibitions about what they could and couldn't do in a studio. I was reading somewhere that, that somebody, has not you, has described this album as you getting back to your roots. I think possibly <laughs> referring to the fact that you're using persona, characters again, that, this, that this album so. is a series of songs sung in character. <laughs> getting back to my roots. Ooh. Stack hill boots to the fore. <laughs> no eyebrows. I'd hate that. Character, David. That obviously yeah, is something yeah, 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 yeah. that, that yes, is a, yes, a constant. I think probably, yes, that's right. I haven't done roles for since I, probably '76 was the last out-and-out out role. Um, uh, but I, I mean that the necessity for roles was di dictated by the the uh, format that we found that we'd fallen into. The card that Brian gave me when we started recording said that I was a griot or a soothsayer or troubadour in a society where all networks are broken down. So I had to sort of explain the news and events to the people of my neighborhood. So that's what I was. <laughs> oh. He gave all musicians, I mean, to another one. He, he uh, I think, probably Reeves. He said, you are the disgruntled ex-member of a South African rock band play all the notes that you, uh, were denied you, um, and things like that. So everybody came into the improvisations from a peculiar perspective. So the one thing that we did know is that they wouldn't all revert to the blues, because what happens when you put six or seven musicians together is they find common ground, and inevitably it's in E, and it becomes <laughs> blues, and it just goes on relentlessly for hour after hour. So we sort of, we weren't going to have any of that. <laughs> Where did you derive the characters that you've, that you've used in, in the various songs? They started, well, they started coming through from all kinds of different places. Um, I brought in my interests at, of the moment, which were ritual body art, um, neo-paganism, the Minotaur, um, I, I guess past references to things like diamond dogs and uh, apocryphal uh, apocalyptic societies. Um, the idea of the angst and anxiety caused by the, uh, the rush uh, toward the end of the uh, millennium. All those things and, and more. I... And I typed it all into my computer. And I have a program in it that was developed for me by um, my friend Ty in San Francisco, um, which was a randomizing program very much it's sort of a, an electronic simile of the way that William Burroughs works um, and so which is a, a method that I've employed for God years since the early 70s again. Which you used to do by hand. By hand. It? In the old days we had to do it by manual labor. So well, this is like cutting up lyrics and then redistributing yes, them. Exactly and so you get some highly interesting juxtapositions. Again it does depend on what the input is. I mean, if the input isn't very interesting, you're not going to get very interesting cut-ups. And it's merely a tool. It doesn't mean that I was stuck with them. So sometimes I would have three and four line groups that would come straight from the computer that I would use in lyric form. At other times, there were two or three sentences that merely sparked an idea. And then I would write those up, those ideas that came from the juxtaposition. So, I mean, it's impossible to... I suppose just for an exercise, you could, you could develop a rule and say, I will only do what the computer says. And that would be kind of interesting. Maybe it's something we could do in the future. But for this particular project, the, we didn't have any of those kinds of rules. Do you have any sense, David, of who, this, of who your, <coughs> your audience now is? <laughs> I mean, I sense that in a way that you, that you are 
you're slightly fleeing from, from the, the mass acceptance that you achieved uh, in yeah. the early Yes, 80s I have been there. <laughs> yes. I think probably it's a grumpy old postmodernist who lives in, in uh, probably in Notting Hill. That's my audience. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I listen to the album and I think, God, I wonder who on earth this is going to appeal to. I'm really not sure. I don't know. I know I have a kind of a core audience who are big enough to kind of go with whatever I'm doing. And at least they'll have a look at it and decide if they need it or don't need it in their lives. And uh, I guess uh, others would take their cue from them, maybe. We'll see. Now, how, how important is success to you at this point? I mean... What kind of success? Well, commercial success. Um, well, I'd like to pay for the making of the albums. Uh, Were they very expensive? Well, we have done a, a, a lot of work. I mean, I think we've probably committed to about four or five different projects, outside merely being one of them. Uh, but as long as that's covered, I'm fairly up for whatever happens. I have no choice. Um, in terms of, is it already a success? I would say so. Uh, artistically, uh, it's, uh, for me, is, uh, I, I, I think it's a tremendous success. You're obviously building a lot of bridges between your musical interests and your interests in fine art. Yes, I am. And probably trying to reach a fine art audience with this album. That's interesting. Uh, I mean, here we are surrounded sure by... That. Yes, I know. Artworks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, these? <laughs> <laughs> they just happen to be they here. They just happen to be here. They came up with room service, this, right? This chain of hotels, in fact, have commissioned me to develop these things for all their hotels from all here right. to Singapore. Oh, hypercycles within hypercycles. We had some censorship in Singapore, but fortunately most other cities have been quite... Um, I hadn't really thought about it in terms of being a vehicle for a fine art audience. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't think so. But, but definitely, definitely uh, among my friends and acquaintances who are involved in other art forms, there really does seem to be um, a movement towards going from one form to another. I'm definitely excited about the idea of artists working in different mediums. Most of the people that I knock about with or know and whatever and work with uh, and do that. Eno himself works not only in music, he works in video installation. Uh, Damien Hurst is now making videos and doing TV spots for German television. Julian Schnabel, the painter, has just become uh, a, a filmmaker uh, with his Basquiat movie. Um, it seems more and more the idea of having walls between the arts is a thing of the past. Um, quite rightly, I think, it, I think its time has come. And uh, I find it very exciting. I think it could yet again re redefine what in fact is the nature of art and what art is for and how it's accomplished. And, less and less emphasis on craft and technique. <laughs> Has the making of this album been a happier experience for you than the making of those, the trilogy of albums that you made with Brian Eno in the 70s? Personally, probably. I mean, personally, I'm in a, a sort of a real, stereotypical, rather happy, middle-aged, domestic contentment state, still with a rapidly eccentric curiosity in what makes the world go round. Um, but I think back then I was uh, um, still the Egon Schiller type boy with angst. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's, I'm just a whole lot more buoyant now than I 